Orange Shirt Day is a nationwide event and movement that began in 2013 that is held to honor and celebrate residential school survivors. It was inspired by the story of Phyllis Wedstad, Northern Sequetmik, who attended residential school and had her orange shirt taken from her during her first day. The orange shirt movement is the legacy of the St. Joseph Mission Residential School, which operated from 1891 to 1981. Eskatemek chief Fred Robbins of Alkali Lake, a former student, had a vision and established commemoration projects and reunion events that took place in Williams Lake, British Columbia in May of 2013. Jukhinuch Wade Hukweda, Phyllis Webstad Renskwaks, Strachum Katstam Straukwin. Hello everyone, my name is Phyllis Webstad. I'm from the Strachum Katstam First Nation, which is Kenna Creek, Dog Creek. And we're uh, located about an hour and a half outside of Williams Lake, BC. I am coming he to you here from our, the Orange Shirt Society office in Williams Lake, BC. We are in Shawetmuk Ulach, meaning the land of the Shushwap people. And we have uh, 17 bands in our nation in the interior of BC. I, the first Orange Shirt Day was in, on September 30th of 2013. And I'm the founder of Orange Shirt Day. The Orange Shirt story is my story. I was, I'm that little girl when I was six. Um, my orange shirt was taken away. I lived with my grandmother on the Dog Creek Reserve from the eight until I was 10. I'm third generation Indian residential school survivor, uh, which means granny attended all of her 10 children, including my mother, myself, and also my son was at the last operating school in Canada. The age in our family to go to residential school was the age of six. And I was no exception. I was the last one to go, however. So when I turned six in July of uh, 1973, I was born in 67, so I'm 53 years old now. My grandmother took me to town here in Williams Lake and to buy, to buy something to go to school. And most students can associate with getting new clothes to go to school. It's an exciting time. And I was no different. I chose a shiny orange shirt for my first day of school. And it had three buttonholes down the front, like it shows in my book, the, the orange shirt story. You probably have seen this. So you can see the three buttonholes in the front there and it lays down. And when I got to the school, my shirt was taken away and I never have, I don't have a memory of ever wearing it again. And I think if, even if the adults told me what was to come, I was just excited to be going to school. I, I wouldn't have comprehended that I would be there for 300 sleeps or one full school year and that I wouldn't be able to go home and so I spent one year there and I was able to go home and be with my family after that one full school year. In May of 2013, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came to Williams Lake and it was a week long truth telling event. So Monday to Friday, and we uh, tacked on a reunion on the weekend for the St. Joseph Indian Residential School that I attended, which is about 20 minutes out of Williams Lake. And I wasn't working then, so I was able to be a part of um, both of the planning committees. So I brought information back and forth and I was chosen by the, uh, our group, our planning group for the reunion to be the spokesperson for the press uh, to invite non-Indigenous people to the truth telling to come and hear the truths of survivors, as well as to let the uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous know when the events were starting and what was happening. So I was a part of that and 
that was my first time being uh, that I talked about my first day of school because I was really nervous. I didn't do a lot of public speaking then and I didn't know what I was um, going to talk about. And it was overwhelming and it was, um, yeah, <clears throat> it was hard. I, um, I had never really linked the residential school experience to my healing. I started my healing journey in 1994 and it wasn't until the TRC came to Williams Lake that I really started to think about the effect that it had on me and my family because we we don't talk about these things in our home it's not when we have dinner it's not discussed when we have gatherings maybe the funny stuff is the funny stories but never the real how i felt and i was sad and i was lonely and i was all of these other things that that kind of feelings about it aren't aren't talked about and when the TR after the TRC was gone, it was like um, it took me three weeks to just to be okay. I was not okay with the world after the TRC left, and I should have phoned somebody, but it was like my whole bones were aching from the inside, my inside core. All of that was being released. I know it's a weird how to explain it, but every experience that I'd had was coming out of my flesh and I'm not um, a pill taker. I don't do drugs or alcohol. I haven't since 1994 and um, Tylenol and Advil weren't helping. All I could do was go through it and cry and sleep and eat and um, about three weeks it lasted. Yeah, it was, it wasn't fun, but um, I haven't felt that since. It was like something I had to go through and I could really see how somebody would choose um, if they feel that to make it go away. And um, yeah, I, I don't share that much that, that with people there. <laughs> That's uh, I think the first time I've shared that publicly with somebody, but yeah, it can associate because we all have that in our memories, right? supposed to be in our DNA and it can come out. And, but the whole story is in our uh, book, uh, The Story Behind Orange Shirt Day. This book just came out called Orange Shirt Day by myself and Joan Sorley. Orange Shirt Day was Joan's idea. She's non-Indigenous and we've been working together. Um, so the whole story is in that book. It's a textbook style for grade five and up. So it's a, a pretty neat book. It's available online. I believe Amazon chapters, your local bookstores, uh, a lot of them are carrying it. And it's uh, very easy to read. It's got like big, um, big lettering and lots of pictures. That's my... <laughs> That's my favorite is uh, a lot of pictures and the writing is big. Yeah, the first year um, I was blown away. I couldn't believe what was happening in 2013. And I'm a doer. I like to do. I like to do something. I didn't know what to do. I was um, watching Facebook online and watching people in their orange shirts and they're doing having events and honoring a lot were their grandparents or their parents. And, and um, so I, um, just a sec, I'll grab something here. So this is what I did. I'm not a scrapbooker, but I made a scrapbook. I went online and I found every picture that I could find and I, I, I got it uh, developed at Walmart. But now I wouldn't be able to find every picture. But in 2013, uh, I did. I spent the winter and I, um, I developed every picture I could find online. And um, so I made, I'm not a scrapbooker, but I made a scrapbook of all the people and all of the um, different pictures that I 
I was that people sent and I even wrote down what they said so that was my way of um, honoring people that took part in the day and it's from the very beginning this whole movement it's like it's been divinely guided something from above is in play here and we don't, we're a small town and I had to order this from a local um, woman a home-based business I told her I want an orange binder for my scrapbooking so she ordered me this and I didn't see it so I just ordered it and um, when it came in and I was scrapbooking I thought okay I, I need to find a picture for here and for here because I thought I'd take one of those and put it in there then I remembered I had two pictures of me at residential school and I had them in an envelope and I went and found them and they just slid right in. It just, it's a perfect size. This is the one you see uh, on the internet and that. And this is me and my cousin, Barb. I had, that's the only other picture I have. And it fits in the front, you know, like how that, it's like another one of those divine um, things, how things happen. So, but since then it's gotten bigger and bigger. That's what Orange Shirt Day is about, is about opening, uh, is about having conversations. It's a door opener to conversations about residential school. And some may not feel comfortable talking about their experience. So my story could be um, a convers an opener. And then maybe other survivors can uh, and their families feel comfortable about sharing their stories and the impacts that that history has had on them. We chose uh, September for Orange Shirt Day when we were talking about it. The uh, group that planned the TRC event, we uh, became the Orange Shirt Planning uh, team. And we were talking about different days, well, maybe April, maybe May, maybe June. And there was reasons for not having it all of those other months. And what we decided was September because that's when the children were taken from their homes and uh, like end of August, beginning of September. And we chose September 30th because it gives teachers time to settle in time to teach the residential school history to students and allows time to plan an event. So we chose September 30th because of that. And if the 30th ends up on a weekend, it's okay to have it on the Friday before or the Monday after or any time really um, throughout the year to bring up the topic of uh, residential schools. Um, I was told a story this morning about how a school uh, to make their children feel safe coming today was their first day. All the staff wore their orange shirts as a welcoming to the students to because everybody's feeling anxious and they wore their orange shirts and it wasn't planned apparently. The teachers just thought um, they would wear their orange and and to make the students more comfortable. So uh, I think the color orange um, is, is um, uh, soothing maybe to some people that um, they can, yeah, I'm not quite sure, but um, when I was at the last event in the TRC event in Vancouver in mid 2013, before the first Orange Shirt Day, I was listening to Survivor Truths and sitting in the audience of, it was a big, big place. And I overheard some uh, survivors, some elders talking, and of course I'm stretching my ear to listen. And one of the elders said that September was crying month. And I knew then that we had chosen the right month and the right date for Orange Shirt Day. So September 30th is what we chose. I thank every student that takes part in Orange Shirt Day, wears an orange shirt, and takes the time to understand 
our history, because it is our history, it's Canadian history, to understand uh, maybe people in their family or uh, their grandparents or maybe their parents went to residential school. So I thank everybody from the schools and a shout out to Cadot Lake School, Little Buffalo School, Clarence Jaycock School, Elizabeth Quintal School, Trout Lake School, and Antica Meg School. So shout out to you all. Thank you for participating in Orange Shirt Day and for taking the time to learn and to care about what happened to us. And my advice on uh, honoring survivors and by wearing an orange shirt, it is honoring survivors because the government, I always say up here, that did this to us, they will never go to jail for what they did, the people that did. What happened was wrong. It should never have happened. And by you wearing an orange shirt or one of our, our Every Child Matters pins, it, to us survivors, it's like a little bit of justice in our lifetime for what happened to us. And uh, bef one day there won't be survivors in Canada and uh, maybe the orange shirt will be what's left to, to honor us. And so in our lifetime, while we're here, seeing you learn about it and honor us by wearing an orange shirt, it just means so much to us. So Gukstam, thank you all for, for that and for taking part in Orange Shirt Day. The residential school system had two objectives to remove and isolate our children from the traditional ways of their nation and to assimilate our people into European culture. European people wrongly assumed that their culture, traditions, and languages were superior to ours. The famous words used to describe the residential school system were to kill the Indian in the child. And it was these ideologies that were the catalyst that led to the intergenerational traumas that our people suffer with today. Residential schools are not old. The last one closed in 1996. In these schools, students suffered the full spectrum of abuse. Residential schools are not part of Canada's history. The trauma is fresh in survivors' minds, bodies, and spirits. My name is Martha Cahoos and I'm from Anhelm Lake, BC. And my band is Ocacho. And there's a residential right on the middle reserve. That's where I was going to. I was like four years old. I can remember 63, I remember a little bit. Walking from the dorm all the way across the reserve in 40 below. We had to get up 7 o'clock in the morning, 7.30, to get to the school. And we had to go down the basement to eat mush, you know, old milk and powdered milk. And they used to force us to drink that powdered milk, and there's still powder on the bottom. And we had to sit there and drink it all. And to this day, I'm <laughs> really keen on milk. Now I'm 61 years old, still go back to reserve, but I can still see the dorm. Now it's torn down, no, no more memories. The parents used to just leave us there because that's what they believe in. My parents did believe them and told us to listen to them or, or else <laughs> we get it. And we didn't know what that meant, but while we are staying there, we got like, we started to notice that they were nice to us the first time, but as the days or months goes on, then we're like getting pulled by the hair or by the ear. And when we get caught chewing gum, they put gum on our nose. <laughs> and I don't know, a lot of humiliation. Like we try running away and go back to our go back to our uh, hunting like 20 miles down the road and we tried and go in on ice but they caught us up. They put runaway girls on our back sign and they cut our hair short and like 
straight bangs and that too shorty. Uh, they made us look bad in front of everybody because we ran away or we... Even though we tried talking carrier our own language and when we go home for the weekend or holidays, we come back but we can't, we couldn't speak, we're not allowed to speak our own language. And while we were playing around with other kids and we tried to speak our language and we got caught and they usually put soap in our mouth or take us to the bathroom. When I was four, I guess we were going to school and I remember going to school. Oh, after we get to the dining room, we pray before we eat and when we're leaving, we pray and go back upstairs and go to our class. Well, we changed into our uniform. We had a gray uniform with a red shirt, long sleeve and the red socks and the black shoes. And we had to change every morning to go to the classroom. And we're all wearing gray skirt and red socks, every one of us. And then after school, we change again and then go back to the dormitory and we call it dorm then, eh? And we got our snack and it was a like a big biscuit and we say, they say it's a dog biscuit. <laughs> I don't know what it was. <laughs> and, but we had that with peanut butter and it was our snack. And when we get into trouble, we used to kneel in the corner on the vent. And we used to kneel there for a couple of hours, looking at the wall. And and our knee hurt it. We used to sit down and they come around. We had to jump up fast and they make us stay longer if they catch us. And we had to kneel and got tired kneeling and... One time I got so stubborn and they, they slapped me and, and my sister got on the way and she helped me out. I just barely remember, but I remember crying. We weren't even allowed to see our own brothers. We weren't allowed to be near boys. And, and we walked long ways just to go to school and like if I was too shy to read in front of everybody, I had to like stand there and get humiliated, like they're using the yardstick on me, like banging on the desk and told me to read and I couldn't remember. I mean, I couldn't say that word and then, and they kept banging the stick on me and I didn't want to read loud anymore. The nuns always like, like, uh, I don't know what they do. They just like leave us outside, tell us not to there's fence around the dormitory and there's our houses not too far, 100 yards away. My house was just in the corner of that fence. Our house, I mean. <clears throat> and we're not allowed to go over that fence and visit our cousins or aunties. And the nuns used to tell us that potlatch was, what was it, superstitious? <laughs> all the potlatch we used to have and they told us we're not allowed to go there when some people passed away or they're having potlatch and then we'll have to run away just to get away from there sometime but we got pulled back in again and they used to make us wear dunce hat to go down the basement and make us wear a funny hat because we were bad or fighting among each other or something. I left when I was turning grade eight. They sent me to a boarding school in Williams Lake Junior High. When I got to Williams Lake, they sent me a mission there and they let me stay there for two weeks and they sent me to a boarding school with 10 other people, 10 other students and we didn't get along. So they sent me to another boarding home and which was good, but there was two of us there, and my auntie died, and I went home for a funeral, and I didn't want to come back to to town again. I didn't. I had seven and one disease last two years ago, and and I sort of treat them the same way I always treated. 
I never showed them love like I supposed to, like I was single parent most of the time, and I was like ordering them around instead of explaining. And uh, nuns never taught us anything like that, how to love and respect others. I'm sorry for what I'm, what I done to my kids, like how I treated them, and and I wanted to make it up for my grandchildren. So I can have love and respect for them, and some of my kids underst understand what I went through, and I didn't know they understood. I thought I was doing the right thing, but later on in junior years, I was like, oh, they can be tough like me and survive through the hard time if like, I don't show them baby love or like run to them if they get a little hurt. I feel bad how I raise my kids the way they, and I, I don't know what to say to them. I don't even know how to say sorry to them or there's a lot of survivors, what they went through and I didn't, I didn't realize there were so many until I read and how they went through, some went through bad, but some went through worse, and, and they survive, and they're healed, or they're trying to be healed. The students who did make it out of their school alive went on to live in a whole new world, one where they weren't equals with their people or the Europeans. Many coped with addiction and ended up homeless. Parents lost their parenting skills and languages were lost. But for intents and purposes, the residential school system failed. We speak our languages, we sing our songs, and dance our dances. My name is Leona Carter, and I'm originally from Onion Lake, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Born in Lloydminster, and uh, I've lived in Edmonton for 53 years. It was called St. Anthony's Residential School, and it was located in on my reserve in Onion Lake. I always say that was a blessing, that it was located on my reserve. <laughs> I got to see our parents every second weekend. We were allowed to go home every second weekend. And of course, summer holidays and things like that. So I'm thankful for that, that it was on my reserve and my dad always checked on us. I turned six that February and then I started school that September. And I was there in Onion Lake for nine years. So I went, you know, to kindergarten to grade eight. They only taught up to grade eight. So we had to be shuffled off to another residential school, you know, for grade nine if you wanted to continue. So I went to another one called St. Gabriel's in Bigger Saskatchewan. Yeah, so 10 years altogether, I was in residential school. But, uh, then the trauma was for me was, holy crap, the different smells and that affected me my whole life. I couldn't go to hospitals. I did not visit people when they were sick in the hospitals because that smell was a trigger. I could not, it was, I don't know. It always reminded me of residential school to go to a hospital or any kind of large institutions. There's a particular smell and that always, mm, I didn't like it. My English was very limited. Um, I learned some English, but not enough to follow uh, what the nuns were saying, what they were telling us. Actually, for the first three years, I was kind of mute. I didn't talk because at school because I didn't know the language. And if we talked, it was in Cree, and we would catch hell. So I had older brothers and sister, one sister that went to school before me. So they learned the English. So they came home, 
And, you know, the little bit of English that I picked up from them, this is what I had to get by with. So, like, you followed everything, you, you learned by rote, you, repetition, listening to other kids beside you who knew the English language, so you paid attention to that. You had to be very attentive <laughs> to everything going on around you, you know. And, in fact, you become hypervigilant in many in many instances, you're, you're very aware of your, you have to become aware of your surroundings because there was always something going on, erasers flying in the classrooms, you know, a big yardstick, oh, I never forget that poor guy getting that across his back, you know, and things like that. So you became hypervigilant to your surroundings to make sure that you're not next to get hit or something gets thrown at you. You know, so you kind of live in a state of fear as well when, when we were there. The nuns were very mean, never smiled. They were never kind. They were just not nice. When you start to look at yourself, I think I was in my late 20s when I started to look at, why am I like this? Why do I do things? Why do I, you know, if, if, if my son, you know, like uh, spilled milk on the floor, I would just get, <gasps> you know, and that's from residential school. You were scared because you would get pushed, you would get shoved you, if you did something wrong. And so here I was still reacting to that fear and, and, and it's only my son. <laughs> you know? So a lot of things like that I started to question from myself, you know, and like I said, in my late 20s, I, I started to really question. When I moved to Edmonton, I was 20. And for 16 years, I had, I had this obsession. I had to go home every second weekend. So it didn't matter what the weather was like. And I would vow, okay, it's icy, it's storming, it's this. I'm staying home this weekend. By 11 o'clock at night, I couldn't handle it. I'd get my kids out of bed, throw them in the back seat of the car, <laughs> cover them up, and drive the 170 miles home. You know, and arrive three o'clock in the morning, and I remember my dad saying, what the hell are you doing, you crazy fool? You're trying to kill the kids? <laughs> you know? I just go, shh, dad, you'll wake them up. You know, so I'd pick them up out of the back seat, carry them, and they'd wake up at grandma and grandpa's, oh, wow, <laughs> they loved it, <laughs> you know. But there was this obsession every second weekend. And I didn't question it until I was 36, 37 years old after being in Edmonton for 20 years. I mean, for 16, 17 years. And I could finally I found the answer. When I was in residential school, we were allowed to go home every second weekend. That's the pattern I developed as a child, and I carried it on into adulthood without question, you know. <laughs> Until, you know, like my dad kind of opened my eyes that I, sh I shouldn't do that to my children, you know. It's, it's dangerous because of the weather conditions and stuff like that. So I started to, you know, really look at that and then found it. Oh, that's where that came from. So I forced myself to stay home many times, and other times still I could not. You know, and one elder that I worked with, he was in his 80s, and he says, you never really overcome it. You just have to learn to live with it. Is <laughs> what he told me. I says, oh, come on. I says, I don't want to have to take this with me into the next life. I says, I want to travel very light. I says, I don't want no baggage when I leave here. <laughs> Tom, of course, he laughed at me, you know, and that's when he says, you never really get over it. Not a long time has passed since residential schools were in operation. But we've come so far in our healing and telling our truths. Take the time right now to honor the survivors you have in your family. Listen to their story. Spend time with them. Laugh and enjoy life with them. All the healing they have done has lifted you up so you do not have to experience the hardships that they have. Take time right now to sing your songs, dance your dances, speak your language. That is who you are. That is why you are here.